Many librarians said to me, I really love this book, I think it's important, but I'm afraid to have it in my library. I'm afraid that parents are going to think that I'm pushing my agenda. So my answer was, you know what, you are pushing your agenda, and your agenda is respect for all, acceptance, celebration of diversity, and that's your agenda. Welcome back to the Book of Life. I'm Heidi Rabinowitz. I'm glad to say that the podcast hiatus is over. As you know, I put the show on hold when I went to work at PJ Library headquarters in the fall of 2017. Well, that turned out to be more of a sabbatical than a career change. I am thrilled to come home to my beloved Feldman Children's Library at Congregation B'nai Israel in Boca Raton, Florida, and to pick up where I left off with the Book of Life podcast. Did you miss me? We'll get the ball rolling again with a very important topic of social justice. In June 2018, I participated on a panel with author Leslie Newman and Hornbook editors Alyssa Gershowitz and Shoshana Flax at the Association of Jewish Libraries annual conference in Boston, and our topic was social justice and Jewish children's books. Here's your chance to be a fly on the wall. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the topic, so be sure to call in or leave a comment at bookoflifepodcast.com. Hi, everyone. My name is Alyssa Gershowitz. So I'm the executive editor of the Hornbook, Inc. It's a children's book review journal. We've been around since 1924. I am an outgoing member of the Sydney Taylor Book Award Committee, sad. Um, And I have a master's in children's literature from Simmons College. Simmons is 10 minutes that way. So it's a very robust children's literature community here, a very robust Jewish community, and a very robust social justice community, I will say. Very robust. (laughs) Very robust. (laughs) Robust is the word. So I will introduce you to the panelists. If anybody does not know Heidi, this is the director of the Feldman Children's Library at Congregation B'nai Israel in Boca Raton. She served on the book selection committee for PJ Library. She is the Book of Life podcast person. <laughs> um, she's chair of the Sydney Teller Book Award Committee. She's been the president of AJL. Heidi is Heidi is the person. So Heidi and I <laughs> know each other from AJL, and also because we both are graduates of Oberlin College which has a very robust (laughs) social justice history. So Heidi and I have that connection, too. So for all of these reasons, I thought Heidi would be great to be on this panel. Shoshana Flax is an incoming member of the Sydney Taylor Book Award Committee. She and I work together at the Horn Book. She holds a master's from the Center of Study of Children's Literature at Simmons College. Yes, MFA. And she's also a writer. And she has a much more observant... Jewish background than I, and she's also very social justice oriented. And she's a young person. Hey! <laughs> oh, and there's Rich Michelson, <laughs> who could join our panel if you would like. An honorary member. <laughs> and this is Leslie Newman, if anybody does not know. Um, Leslie has written 70 books for children and adults. Her book, Hetzel the Cat Who Composed, won the Sydney Teller Book Award last year. She's been on the Notable list. Her latest book is Later. called <laughs> Sparkle Boy. And Leslie's history with literature, Judaism, and social justice does not need to be explained, but we'll talk about it anyway. She's very well known for Heather Has Two Mommies, groundbreaking book from the late 80s. So I have about a million questions for these people, but I also want to have this be a conversation and to hear how other people have been approaching social justice in terms of books and life in this world that we live in. I will start out by asking you all how you got involved in what you're doing now and how and when the social justice piece entered your work and your life. I can start. I call myself an accidental activist because really I just always wanted to be a writer and I didn't realize that what I was going to write about had all these political implications, which I started out as a novelist, 
well, a poet, but my first published book was a novel. It was called Good Enough to Eat, and it was about a Jewish feminist who was struggling with body image issues and her sexuality, and then she came out. It's pretty thinly autobiographical. And I didn't realize at the time that writing a book with a lesbian protagonist was a political act. So from there, I went to children's books, and my first children's book was Heather Has Two Mommies, which was the first children's book that had a happy, intact family of two moms and a child. And nobody would publish that book. I tried 50 different publishers, and then my grandmother used to always say, just because they say no to me, you think I'm finished? (laughs) And so I've taken that on. And a friend and I, a friend who was a lesbian mom with a two-year-old at the time, and I decided to do the book ourselves. And we did a Kickstarter campaign before there was Kickstarter. So we actually put letters in envelopes (laughs) and stamps and licked them. And again, I didn't think that was a political act, but it turns out that it was. So in terms of social justice, I've always just written about what was important important to me, not consciously trying to upset the status quo, but, you know, realizing that we live in a world where things which, to me, are just natural, like the most important thing about a family is that all the people in it love each other, which is a line from Heather S. to Mommy's, is a radical notion. So that's kind of how I got started. And then I kept going. <laughs> because why stop now, right? And so then I wrote books like Sparkle Boy and October Morning, a song from Matthew Shepard, which uh, talks about Matthew Shepard's murder in 68 different poems from various viewpoints. And even my book coming out, Giddle's Journey, an Ellis Island story now is political, right? Because it's about immigration. I actually feel very strongly about tikkun olam, repairing the world, and we all have to figure out for each of us how we do that. And I feel the way that I can do that best is through story. In my case, I would say that the social justice aspect of my professional life has just sort of naturally intertwined. I mean, I've definitely, like Leslie, have been a strong believer in tikkun olam, but I didn't go into the horn book saying this is a tikkun olam job. But in the meantime, the We Need Diverse Books movement has been really big, like concurrently with my time at the horn books. And as a bookseller, too, I was trying to hand sell diverse books, and now that's a big focus of I work at the Hornbook as well as my own writing. Luckily, the Hornbook is a really supportive organization. We've gone on protest marches together and that kind of thing. And then I have a small side business called Parodies for Charities, which is... Thank you. A lot of things like song parodies and TV movie parodies. The idea is that I'll write you something silly in exchange for you donate to a charitable organization. What's your current charity? Current charity is makeitokay.org, which if you ever heard the uh, Hilarious World of Depression podcast, it's tied in with that, but uh, it's about eliminating the stigma around mental illness. Wow, cool. Thank you. I kind of feel as if I'm here under false pretenses in a way, because I haven't exactly done any specific activist thing like a you know project in that way. But I try to incorporate it into what I do as a librarian. And actually, part of why I wanted to be here with this panel is to learn more about what I can do, because I feel like I don't do enough. That's so Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> You're Heidi, and you don't feel like you don't do enough. But as an Oberlin hippie, you know, I automatically want this to be incorporated into my work. So the ways that I have been so far able to incorporate this is a little bit through story time, but this is where I really feel like I need to pick other people's brains because I'm mostly working with white, Jewish, privileged, Boca Raton preschoolers who are not aware of the uneven playing field. Mm you know, through their own eyes and and their own life. They just don't know that the world could be unfair. And I struggle with how to inform them about systemic injustice because what do you tell them? They're only little. But at the same time, they have white privilege. And if they were some other children from a different neighborhood, they would just know that. So it's not that they're too young to know it. It's that I'm squeamish, and and a lot of the adults around them are squeamish about introducing this topic. So if anybody has found an age-appropriate way to explain to very young children that the world just is not fair, I would like to talk with you and and learn more. I would suggest introducing them to some of Rich Michelson's books. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but I'm, but I'm talking about, like, three-year-olds. His books are maybe a little bit older. What do you think? Right. Rich, what do you yeah. think? Uh, I generally don't use them until five years old. Five years old or so? Okay. Yeah. 
one of the women who couldn't be on the panel today because she has walking pneumonia. Um, Hillary Saxton runs a social justice story time in Cambridge. And Cambridge itself is a very sort of liberal environment, but it's also very diverse. And so the community that Hillary is serving... <laughs> It's a lot of little rich white children of professors, and then it's a lot of everybody else too. And mm-hmm. she's come up with a really good story time system. So I will. Yeah, get you and in touch I was for interested her. to hear more about that. But also, that's opt in. The parents who want their children to hear that yes. will bring them. Yep. As a school setting, if I do that, I could get my director in trouble. Yeah. So it's it's not exactly my place necessarily to introduce that in a captive audience situation is part of my my problem but so it's story time is part of where I do what I can mm-hmm. collection development is a way that I try to have a diverse collection and then I'm trying to do a little bit of teacher education too mm. I revamped the Thanksgiving collection I removed mm-hmm. anything where people were playing Indian mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I removed anything that lied about how the pilgrims and the Indians were great buddies mm-hmm. so I just <laughs> took those out it's a lot uh, and it took out a lot of books yeah. And I replaced them with books about gratitude that were not necessarily oh, Thanksgiving mm-hmm. specific mm-hmm. because I figured that was the, the spirit of what the point of the holiday is really anyway. And I worked on a presentation that will probably be given this coming school year at a teacher staff meeting about why you shouldn't dress up the kids mm-hmm. in you know shopping bag Indian vests and fake beaded things and feathers on their head, why this is rude to do. So those are the three areas that I've been trying to incorporate social justice into my work is teacher education, collection development, and story time as much as, as I can, but I feel like that's where I need to do more work. Have you had negative pushback for trying to do any um, of those things? A little bit where I, I tell the teachers how aggravated I am about Thanksgiving and they don't know what I'm talking about, yeah. but not so much actual pushback. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's one of the tricky pieces is that people who are aware can be hyper-aware and there's a stumbling block to get people to sort of believe you or to recognize it or to, to really question things that people take for granted. People also get very defensive. Very right? defensive. Right. And that's very <laughs> tricky. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And especially if it's something they've always done. And it's so yeah. cute. And I did it when I was a kid. And yes. I turned out okay. And, you know, yes. that kind of thing. Yes. So Absolutely. Yeah. Was there anything, I'm thinking, Shoshana, because I know a little bit about your background, is there anything specifically Jewish that has informed the person that you are today and the work that you do. I mean, I remember growing up with picture books like The Very Best Place for a Penny about how the very best place is a Tadaka box. And we grew up putting money in the Tadaka box. So there was always that conversation about there are people in the world who aren't as lucky as you are. And if we can help them a little bit, then that's a good thing to do from a Jewish perspective. What about either of you? Well, my grandparents were all immigrants, and I was very aware of that. And my grandmother always talked about when she came over, of course, she had nothing, but she still thought it was important to give to charity. So if she made two cents, she would give one cent. And she always told the story about this young woman who had some kind of physical... I think she had one leg, if I'm remembering correctly, and my grandmother always gave specifically to a charity that subsidized her, and then one day they told her they didn't need her money anymore because the young woman had gotten married. Mm-hmm. And my grandma was very, very happy about that. But, um, you know, she always drummed into us that there's always going to be someone who has less than you, even if you have nothing. And that just always stayed with me. Coming from a liberal hippie background, I think it was uh, just sort of drummed into me that social justice and Judaism are just, they go together. Mm-hmm. It's like bagels and cream cheese. <laughs> <laughs> At the Boston Public Library yesterday, there was a really great panel that Leslie was on. The topic was, what makes a Jewish book? And I'd like to talk a little bit about that, because what you said was really interesting. What, what to you all makes a Jewish book? Is it content? Is it values? Um, is it the authorship? Do you remember what brilliant thing I said? <laughs> you, you, had, you had encouraged the person who asked the question to interrogate what was behind the question and what mattered to them about 
the question and the answer, which and also is a very Jewish thing. Right. <laughs> answer a question <laughs> with another question. Um, also a way to get out of but, answering. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe look, look at that. What do you two think about, about that? I, I remember thinking that you had a great answer for that on yesterday's panel, <laughs> but I can't remember the specific details. Well, what I, yeah. for, I started off by, of yeah. course, comparing it to the LGBT experience mm-hmm. and saying, well, you know, we've been asked for, you know, in the 80s, well, what's a lesbian book? And I said, well, it's a female book that's attracted to another female book, <laughs> right? <laughs> so a Jewish book is, a, you know, a book that celebrates Shabbos and whatever. <laughs> but I think I asked more questions than answer, you know, is it any book by a Jewish author? Is it any book that has Jewish content, whether it's by a Jewish author or not? Is it any book that has Jewish values in it. I mentioned the book, How to Heal a Broken Wing, which is a book I love. And it has no overt Jewish content, but it's about a little boy who finds a hurt bird in the city, and he's the only one that notices the bird and stops and helps heal the bird, which I think is a huge Jewish value, you know, paying attention and being kind to someone who's less fortunate than you and all of that. And then I asked, why does this matter, this question? So I think that pretty much sums up what I had said. I would add also that even a book that you consider a Jewish book definitely does not have to be just for Jewish kids. I think that's super important, just as we talk about windows and mirrors, the Rudy and Sims Bishop term about you need to see yourself reflected, but you also need to have the opportunity to read about kids having other experiences. And I think that's that's true of Jewish books, that's true of books centering African-American stories or Latino stories or whatever it is. So I think the fact that it's hard to define is not a bad thing at all. Mm -hmm. I think the answer changes depending on what you need. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in my library, I don't count Jewish authorship as important. I count Jewish content as important. Mm -hmm. But if you were creating a collection that had to do with identity and pride, maybe it would be authorship, even if the book was completely secular. Mm -hmm. And then I also am a strong believer in secular books being used to teach Jewish values. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, No David. I always Mm -hmm. use No David in the high (laughs) holidays because, you know, he does the wrong thing and then he fixes his mistake and he says, I'm sorry. So what is a Jewish book depends on what you need from a Jewish book at the Mm -hmm. time. I love the idea of using no day. <laughs> Does everybody know that book? By David Shannon. Very yeah. mischievous little boy. He's just running around the house. He's running around the neighborhood. He's throwing things. He's stomping. He's just misbehaving. And the, the famous scene from the book is the illustration of him running down the street. And all you see is this little naked tushy <laughs> down the street. But yeah, so to be able to, to see books that way and plot them in and to identify the Jewish values in secular books, I think was really interesting. And you were saying that Quetzal was not considered Jewish enough. Right. Um, in, it won the Sydney Taylor Award. So but. it is really, it's, it's all relative and it's very subjective. But why to you is Quetzal a Jewish So book? if you don't know the book Quetzal, the Cat Who Compose, is about a cat who was owned by a composer named Moshe Kotel. And one day Quetzal runs down the keyboard of the piano and Moshe Kotel writes down what he hears, and he sends it off to a contest, and lo and behold, it gets an honorable mention. It's a true story. It had its premiere, and Mr. Cotel brought Quetzal to the recital hall, and when they announced Quetzal's name, she meowed, and chaos ensued. I mean, it's like, how could that not have been a children's book? Right? But anyway, so... It's a book about a Jewish character. But also, I feel like it exemplifies Jewish values in terms of Quetzal was found on the street, so it's kindness and taking care of the homeless. And actually, in the morning, Moshe Kotel feeds the cat, and in Judaism, you feed your animals before you feed yourself. But it's also more important is the notion of kavanah, which is intention, and then being open and aware to all the beauty and the unexpected moments of just pleasure in one's own life and how that's a spiritual concept. And that he had the wherewithal to hear something and have this aha moment and write it down and see the beauty of it. And that's the only time that cat ever did that. <laughs> Which is really Ketzel amazing. Signed a check. Oh, and and Ketzel got a royalty check. Yes. And was brought to the bank and put paws in the ink pad and, and signed the back of it. It was $19.62. It's in the office now. <laughs> it's also a Jewish concept, right? you got to get paid for your work. <laughs> Well, and I will say that this is a big part of the discussion for the Sydney Taylor Book Awards. When the deliberation time rolls around, we look at the books that are there, and 
Some books are obviously Jewish. There's no question, and you judge them on those merits. And some books, like I don't remember if specifically if Ketzel was one of them, but there are books that are not as overtly Jewish. You know, not the librarian of Auschwitz, let's say, but books that do have Jewish values or the family's name is Jewish, or you know it's a you know it's a Jewish book, but is it Jewish enough? for this award, and that's a real consideration. There have been you know, excellent books that have been deemed, maybe saying not Jewish enough is a little too flip, but not as appropriate for this award as some others. So that conversation is always, is always happening, and I feel like that's always happening in the world. Not this enough, not that enough. And who's asking the question and who's making the judgment, I think is also um, something to consider. <laughs> So we, we talk about Jewish values as meaning different things to different people. And what do you do in your work when your Jewish values don't jibe with other equally valid Jewish values? Have you had to have that conversation with your work? And if so, how, how, how do you do it? How do you come to the middle? Well, it sounds like there's an, an assumption that one writes for an audience. Oh, that was right. Hard. Which I don't mm-hmm. specifically. I mean, I just I write what I want to write as truthfully and as beautifully and as meaningfully as possible, and then hope it finds its audience. But I never think about trying to please other people in, in terms of anything: their background, their values, their beliefs. I mean, if I'm lucky enough to get that book published and it doesn't jive with someone's belief, they just won't buy the book. Mm-hmm. I was brought to Texas to talk about my book, Sparkle Boy. And many librarians said to me things like, I really love this book, I think it's important, but I'm afraid to have it in my library. I'm afraid that parents are going to think that I'm pushing my agenda, you know, all that stuff. So my answer was, you know what? You are pushing your agenda, and your agenda is respect for all, acceptance, celebration of diversity, and that's your agenda as a librarian. And so... If you put any other group, let's say you had a book about an interracial marriage, would you hesitate to send that book home with a kid? You know, you have to put the LGBT stuff, take that out and put in any other group and see what your answer is. And usually it's not the answer, oh, I would never send that book home with a kid. So I think we have to look at our own internalized homophobia, our own fear, and move beyond that to create a safer world for everybody. So that would be my answer. Yeah, um, what comes to mind in terms of book reviewing is we always say, inform, not alarm. Like, it's it's our job to let librarians know what's in a book so they can decide whether it's right for their libraries. So, for example, I wrote a review somewhat recently of a book where the character was Jewish and he had two moms. And it wasn't a huge part of the book, but it was All, all Three Stooges by Erica Pearl. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know see. Uh, it was also an interfaith family, and I, so I, I had a sentence in there about how all of that was treated casually. You know, as far as I was concerned, that's a great thing. But if you're a librarian for whom that's not a book you want in your library, you now have that information, mm-hmm. and you can do with it what you want. Mm-hmm. Did you also put any kind of content warning about other spoilery things? Oh yeah, I mean, the, I mean, that was one sentence, and it's a book where it actually it looks like a very funny book, yeah, but it's about a funny. kid who loves comedy and someone he knows commits suicide. So it's him dealing with that. So I mean, almost half the review was about that, and there was a sentence saying this is not the light read implied by the title or the jacket. All Three Stooges by Erica Pearl. What about you, Heidi? In the real world of having to interact with patrons, and how does this... Yeah, I haven't really had too much conflict. I guess I work in a place that I'm well aligned with. Mm -hmm. So Good. I have two questions. One is, have you been encouraged to add or subtract content from any of your books for fear of offending, or whatever you want to call it? And... Other question is about kids' fan letters that have really spoken to you in this sort of personal, um, the way that your work has affected them personally. Yeah, so no, I've, I've never been asked to either add or take away content by an editor in terms of less LGBTQ stuff, less Jewish stuff. But the opposite has kind of happened for me, which is that I try, and my editor, Arthur Levine, is here, so I'm going to talk about oh, Fat no. Chance, Arthur which I was published in 1994. <laughs> it's a book about a, a young girl with an eating disorder, and so I was trying to write a universal book. 
so I didn't make her anything. It takes place over the course of a school year, so I'm writing, and she's, you know, binging, and she's doing whatever, and then I get to December, and I thought, oh, God, I have to... Christmas, like, I don't know anything about Christmas. I didn't celebrate Christmas. I don't know how to do that, and then I thought, well, then there's Hanukkah, and then I decided that I was just going to make her Jewish. So then her eating disorder, like, revolved around the Jewish holidays. So she, like, she ate all the apples and honeys on Rosh Hashanah, and then she fasted on Yom Kippur, and she lost two pounds, so she was very happy. And then so she, she became a real person once I infused Judaism into her. So she had to be something, right? And to me, you're either Jewish or you're not Jewish. That's all there is. So I had to like, expand my mind a little. So just in my own writing. And I had another book called Here is the World, which was not Jewish. And... I couldn't sell it anywhere, and once I put in all the Jewish holidays, it sold immediately. Mm. So it's sort of, I don't know if I call it self-censorship, but my kind of desire to speak to a bigger audience always backfires. (laughs) Always. And then when I have books with Jewish content, I know they're not only read by Jewish families and Jewish kids. You know, I know that they have a wider audience. So that's just kind of a lesson that I've had to learn a few times. And in terms of letters from kids, I've gotten wonderful letters from kids, mostly from Heather Has Two Mommies, like, thank you for writing Heather Has Two Mommies. I know that you wrote it just for me. Mm-hmm. And that actually came from a six-year-old girl named Tasha who's African-American. And Heather is not only white, but she's blonde. And I thought that was really interesting mm-hmm. that Tasha really thought I wrote it just for her. Mm-hmm. I got a letter from a little boy who said, how come I can't have two mommies? <laughs> and a mom and a dad. So all kinds of interesting things. But my favorite letter recently was from a little boy who read my book Sparkle Boy, which is about a little boy who likes to wear skirts and sparkly bracelets and, and paint his nails. And he said, what I like best about Sparkle Boy is everything. <laughs> and then recently, and this is the last thing I'll say because I'm taking up a lot of time, I got a cartoon or a drawing from a kid who said, I think Sparkle Boy should have a different last page or another page. So at the end, the boy and his sister go to the library where some other boys tease him for wearing a skirt. Then they leave and go home and his sister comforts him. So this little boy drew this cartoon that said, and then they went back to the library next day and the boys apologized to Casey. You know, and he had a nice drawing of Casey in his skirt and the boys being nice to him. And talk about social justice. I mean I loved that. I just thought that was so great. So I wanted to ask also about We Need Diverse Books and the Own Voices movement in children's books as a whole. What have people's experiences been with that? I'm thinking of a blog post that we, the Hornbook, published a few months ago that Marjorie Engel picked up for Tablet, so it got wider readership. It was a new picture book about 15 women who changed the world. Beautiful picture book, very diverse selection. It was exactly what you would want, and yet (laughs) there's no Jewish women. You know, there were some exciting World War II women, you know, spies jumping into Germany, and they weren't Jewish. And this seems to be not atypical. The, well, what, what do people think about this? The fact that the diverse books movement hasn't really centered yeah. Jewish books. I, I think that it's an ongoing issue that because so many Jews are white, are not of color, and therefore have some privilege, we, we're in a position of privilege and in a position of, of whatever the opposite of privilege is. <laughs> but because we can pass, mm. I think that we tend to get left out of the diversity discussion, mm-hmm. and the only way to be in it is to speak up mm-hmm. and demand a place at that table. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's just that they don't think of it, or sometimes it could be that there is some latent anti-Semitism going on, but they need to understand that even though we do have some privilege, we also have the issues that minorities face and that yeah. we would like to... <laughs> be in conversation with them and that we do share issues with them even if they don't realize it. So I I think it's just a matter of us advocating louder Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for being part of the diversity movement. And can I just add one thing? I was listening to the podcast Code Switch, Mm -hmm. which you know is about racial issues, and they had an episode that was about trying to define how Judaism fits in, and they said up front in the introduction that they hadn't approached it for a long time because they 
didn't think about it being part of their mission to cover Judaism. And then it was pointed out to them that, yes, this is part of the whole diversity thing. And they spent the whole episode trying to define it. And of course they couldn't because there is no one definition of Judaism. And I think maybe that also makes it a little bit more confusing for the, the diversity movement folks mm-hmm. because, like, what is it? Is it a culture? Is it a religion? You know, they're not even sure what they're dealing with. Mm-hmm. I was, went to a diversity workshop, and it was very interesting because the leader started by saying, you know, if you like pistachio ice cream, move to the left. If you like strawberry ice cream, move to the right. And if you, do, you know, like a few of those things. And then she said, if you're white, go to this part of the room. If you're a person of color, go to this part of the room. So people separated. And then this group of people came into the middle of the room, and we just kind of looked at each other. And the leader came and said, who are you? And we just said, we're the Jews. <laughs> we didn't know where to go. <laughs> you know? And it's still, we, it's, a, it's very complicated. I'm, I'm very uncomfortable when, in the, in the sense, is just checking white. I usually put other, mm-hmm. you know? A question, I guess, for all the editors and publishers here. Like, the kids want books where characters are like them, just in the book. Like, they have to be like the poor superhero. They don't really talk about him having two dads as like a big deal. It's just he happens to have two dads. So would Heather have two mommies still have the same title today, 20 years later? Or if I... <laughs> how does that work in the publishing industry? Like, Does casual diversity sell, it sounds yeah, like, we, you're saying? That's yeah. I, I, I would say there's a place for both. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, but I think it's great that there is such an increase in casual diversity, but it doesn't mean you completely eliminate the... Mm-hmm explanatory books because it's the first time somebody's encountering it you know as new kids get born they don't know anything so everybody needs an explanation initially and I feel like we took a lot for granted in the world in the past (laughs) eight ten years and we assumed that we didn't need to spell things out because we sort of felt like we moved past that but I don't Think that it's that's you know what it's like. It's really like women can be anything. Right. <laughs> like, well, now you don't have to say that. You just do it. But right, there was a point in time where you had to say that out loud, yeah. and now well, maybe we're at point. Like, she persisted. Yeah. Right. You know, she yeah. persisted. Yeah. 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 And, I'm sorry. That's a, that's very much a. There's a place for both. Yeah. We are almost out of time. I will say one last thing that my last question was a little bit of a trick question with the We Need Diverse Books because I joined the Cindy Taylor Committee and I thought, oh, I'm going to spend four years reading Holocaust literature and I really need to prepare myself for this. But I really have found that the diversity in Jewish books is there. It's not enough. Of course, we always need more. We want more. But it's it's not that hard to find. And what I spent four years reading has, you know, it's opened my mind and it's... It's, re- it's not exactly what you just what you would think it would be. So that's the good news. And we are out of time, unfortunately. I think we could keep talking, but all right. Thank you. Wait, hey, so I just, I just wanted to mention, as you know, I host the Book of Life podcast, and I'm going to publish a book list there of some of the kinds of books that are in my library in terms of trying to find the diverse books and the gratitude books to replace the outdated Thanksgiving concepts and some of the Jewish diversity books. So if you want to take a look at that, it's going to be on the bookoflifepodcast.com. Thanks, Heidi. I'm Vicki Weber. I'm from Apples and Honey Press. I'm going to be talking soon on the Book of Life podcast about our upcoming book, American Golem, The New World Adventures of an Old World Mud Monster. And I'd like to dedicate it to little boys everywhere who love baseball. If you enjoy the Book of Life podcast, please become a patron at patreon.com slash bookoflife. Leave a review on iTunes or a comment on our blog at bookoflifepodcast.com. You can also like our page at facebook.com slash bookoflifepodcast. Follow us at twitter.com slash bookoflifepod. Email us at bookoflifepodcast at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail. 561-206-2473. The Book of Life is a podcast service of the Feldman Library at Congregation B'nai Israel in Boca Raton, Florida at cbiboca.org and is supported in part by the Association of Jewish Libraries at jewishlibraries.org. Our background music is provided by the Freilach Makers Klezmer String Band. Thanks for listening. And
and happy reading. <laughs>